Hello, I'm Dr. Gautam and today I'll be presenting a practical approach to hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is a very frequent problem we see on a day-to-day -day basis in the hospitals and, uh, and, and a lot of students and doctors uh, find it a little complicated to approach this problem. Um, let me first um, go through a couple of uh, cases and then I'm going to the topic. So case one. Here is a 40-year-old man with diarrhea and vomitings. He has oliguria and uh, has borderline low blood pressures when he comes to the emergency room. He has dry mucous membranes and reduced skin turgor. His uh, sodium is uh, low at 115. Mild hypokalemia and creatinine is 1.4, indicating prerenal azotemia. So what do you think is the cause of hyponatremia? And what are the tests that you will order and how you will treat him? So um, a couple more cases. Uh, we think about these uh, cases and how you would approach and then we'll come back uh, for the answers by the end of the presentation. Case 2. Here is a 45 year old man who is a chronic smoker presented with cough, breathlessness and weight loss. He also had loss of appetite and he has been feeling more drowsy and somnolent for a few days. His x-ray showed a lung mass and uh, the biopsy revealed small cell lung carcinoma. Um, vitals are stable. He doesn't. He doesn't appear um, either hypovolemic or hypervolemic. In fact, his fluid status seems uh, more or less normal. He's a little drowsy, but uh, you can easily arouse him. Sodium is very low at 110. So, what do you think is the cause of hyponatremia in the second case, and how will you evaluate and treat? In the last case. Here is a 65-year-old man who has history of uh, coronary artery disease. He has had uh, STEMI and has had uh, angioplasty and stent placement in the past. And he has breathlessness and edema in the legs. And on examination, he appears fluid overloaded with elevated JVP, basal, basal crackles at the lung basis and also pitting edema. His sodium is 122 and creatinine is 1.4 and uh, ECG shows left bundle branch block which is old and also chest x-ray which shows cardiomegaly and bilateral small pleural effusions. So, so he appears hypervolemic and what do you, what do you think uh, your, your approach should be? And here are uh, five options you have. Uh, which one would you pick? So while you think about these three cases, we'll uh, briefly go through different causes and how you will diagnose and manage. So, hyponatremia is defined as uh, sodium less than 135 milliequivalents per liter, the normal being 135 to 145. And this is uh, the most common electrolyte, electrolyte abnormality in the hospitalized patients. We, we come across this problem on a day-to-day -day basis for, for quite a significant number of our patients. Most causes of hyponatremia reflects water imbalance when, when, when the, 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 the title suggests hyponatremia means probably sodium is less, but that is not the case. It is actually a problem with water handling or water imbalance and not sodium imbalance. So, so there is no, I mean, there, it doesn't automatically mean that the total sodium or total body water has changed. It's, it's more, it's mostly um, a, a problem with handling of uh, water, I mean excess water in most of the cases. And because water is handled by the antidiuretic hormone, so this hormone has a primary role in the pathophysiology of uh, this condition. So basically the way patient's volume status is very important when you're trying to approach this problem. Um, you have to um, you have to classify the patient's volume status as uh, hypovolemic, euvolemic or hypervolemic and this you will get from history and clinical exam. You should also check the serum osmolality which is very important and as I just said in the previous slide hyponatremia reflects excess water related to sodium rather than sodium deficiency and what happens in the hospitalized patients they drink a lot of water then many of them are on 5% dextrose or D5 water which is basically water it doesn't have any and osmolality is zero in, in 5% dextrose or D5W, so, which is a hypotonic fluid, so you should avoid giving 5% dextrose or D5W 
for these patients. So um, this is what I made up from what I can understand or gather from the uh, pathophysiology of uh, hyponatremia. Um, on the left is hypovolemic hyponatremia. As you can see, there is loss of both sodium and water here, but the loss of sodium is a little more compared to water or, or, or if, you, if, if you take it other way, there is loss of both sodium and water but the patient is drinking only water so there is relative water excess. Another thing is whenever there is hypovolemia, ADH is secreted and that retains more water. So deficit of sodium and water is replaced by only water so there is a relative excess of water on the left side. So that is hypovolemic hyponatremia. The commonest cause being uh, diarrhea or gastrointestinal losses. In the middle, in the middle, we have euvolemic hyponatremia, where the sodium content is normal. Sodium is content is normal, but there is excess water retention, and this is mostly due to um, secretion of inappropriate secretion of ADH hormone, antidiuretic hormone. Because of excess secretion of ADH hormone, you have excess of water related to sodium uh, but the patient's volume status is is, is normal is neither reduced nor increased he doesn't apply he, he doesn't he doesn't seem fluid overloaded and his blood pressure everything is normal he doesn't appear hypovolemic either so he's euvolemic and the commonest cause being SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion so this one I'm talking about SIADH and on the right side you have hypervolemic hyponatremia where the patient is fluid overloaded, the common causes being congestive heart failure, kidney failure, that is uh, chronic renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, and cirrhosis of liver. All these conditions can cause fluid overload where there is retention of both sodium and water, but water is in relative excess compared to sodium, and that's the reason why there is hyponatremia. So uh, this is the most important slide, this is the most important slide in this presentation. So try please uh, remember the, uh, the, 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 the basic conditions and the outline of this, uh, this flowchart. So um, initially we check serum osmolality and uh, the most common cause here is hypotonic hyponatremia. Okay. Um, and uh, this is further classified into hypervolemic, euvolemic, and hypervolemic. Okay, so in hypervolemic, as we just discussed, you have dehydration due to gastrointestinal loss, or it could be renal loss. In gastrointestinal or extra renal loss, you have urine sodium less than 10. Why? Because whenever there is loss loss of uh, salt and water, the kidneys try to preserve the sodium, and less of sodium is seen in the urine. So less of sodium is thrown out, more of sodium is reabsorbed to maintain the intravascular volume. So that's why urine sodium is less. And here you have urine sodium is more whenever there is renal salt loss, mostly due to diuretics. And then the middle category, euvolemic hyponatremia, where, the, where, where there is water excess due to inappropriate, inappropriate ADH secretion, which is the most common cause of euvolemic hyponatremia. And there are some other conditions which we'll come back to. And then there is hypervolemic hyponatremia, where you, where you see uh, fluid overloads, uh, where, where there is fluid overload in these conditions, these four conditions which I just discussed, congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, and advanced CKD. And then, although hypotonic hyponatremia is the most common, we should not forget that other two categories, which sometimes you can come across, one is isotonic hyponatremia, where there is excess of protein or excess of lipids, either chylomicrons, triglycerides, and these can affect the uh, measurement of sodium and it's also called a pseudo hyponatremia because it's not a real hyponatremia it's more a problem with the lab measurement so the modern the modern assays uh, should get rid of this problem okay and um, uh, then we have hypertonic hyponatremia where uh, there is uh, examples being hyperglycemia and mannitol administration in hyperglycemia, what happens is that the water comes out of the cell, what we call as translocation. So when there is uh, increased uh, blood glucose levels in the serum or plasma, the water comes out from, into, from the cell into the, into the, into the, into the interstitium. Uh, same thing happens when you give mannitol 
So as a result, you have hypertonic hyponatremia. And so there is a uh, whenever you have very severe hyperglycemia, you may see that the sodium level is a little on the lower side. It's low, and we'll come back to that as well in the in the, in, the, in the next few slides. Um, so initially a, a brief mention about hyp isotonic hyponatremia again which uh, we just went over. So the, here the lipids and proteins do not affect osmolality but they do, measure, they do affect sometimes with measurement of serum sodium whereas the newer assays should not have this problem. So whenever the blood sugar blood glucose is between 200 and 400 for every 2 milliequivalents for every 100 milligrams rising glucose there is a fall of sodium of 2 milliequivalents. Then we come to hypotonic hyponatremia, which I said was the most common cause of hyponatremia. As you, as you can see, this is the formula for serum osmolality. And here you have 2 into sodium plus glucose plus BUN, glucose by 18 plus BUN by 2.8 in milligrams per deciliter. So when the sodium goes down, the osmolality also goes down. So here you have hypotonic hyponatremia. So um, when there is hypotonicity, serum osmolality is low because of low sodium. So sodium affects the tonicity of the, of the, of the plasma. So again, hypotonic hyponatremia can be divided into hypovolemic, uvolemic, and hypervolemic. I think you'll be hearing these terms again and again throughout this presentation, so please bear with me. So uh, this is kind of a repetition of what we did from with that flow chart. Hypovolemic hyponatremia due to renal or extrarenal loss, reduced intravascular volume, stimulates the secretion of ADS by pituitary, which causes free water retention from hypotonic fluid replacement. So a patient with diarrhea who is drinking only water or is given 5% dextrose will develop this. That's the reason why they should be given normal saline and not and not 5% dextrose or, uh, or plain water or free water. So here, what have, what's happening here is that the losses of water and salt are replaced only by water. So that's the reason why they have hyponatremia. And then uvolemic hyponatremia it has the broadest differential diagnosis. And most of the causes, uh, they exert their effects through their, through their action on ADH hormone. So um, hypothyroidism, you have to rule out hypothyroidism and arterial insufficiency. Medications is a big cause and then SIDH. We'll come to it in a greater detail in a little while. Primary polydyspsia. I'm sorry. Primary polydyspsia, where you have increased water water ingestion, like say more than 10 liters a day, or excess of uh, beer intake, or other causes. Uh, we go. We won't go into the details here. Thiazide diuretics is a very common cause of hyponatremia. So please, please check. A, take a good drug history when you are when you are dealing with a patient with hyponatremia because. Uh, because drugs are uh, such a, are a culprit in most of the cases, many of the cases that I see, and many of them are hypertensives taking hydrochlorothiazide for their hypertension, and they commonly present with hyponatremia. So also you see this in uh, post-operative patients, um, uh, like um, because why why do you see hyponatremia so commonly in uh, post-operative patients? Because pain is a potent stimulator of uh, ADH hormone. Uh, not only pain but nausea and then this is a review of uh, hypertonic uh, sorry I'm sorry hypervolemic hypotonic hyponatremia which you see in fluid overloaded conditions here in what happens in congestive heart failure is that because of poor cardiac output there is a loss of uh, effective circulating volume so the kidneys don't don't have adequate perfusion so what happens there is Increased activity of the renin angiotensin system and aldosterone is also secreted and also ADH is also secreted. All these um, lead to water retention because antidiuretic hormone secretion it leads to water water absorption and retention. So here there is a although the patient appears fluid overloaded because of the poor cardiac output or other reasons there is a low circulating volume which causes this problem. So. Um, this is a flowchart uh, where you see the same things which we just discussed. So uh, the last step, urine sodium, if it is less than 20 or 30, it is uh, extra renal losses like for example GI losses. If more than urine sodium, more than 30 is renal losses. And urine osmolarity is also a very important test and uh, which, is, uh, which is low in uh, psychogenic polydipsia because they, they excrete a very, uh, they put out a dilute urine because they are uh, drinking uh, tons and tons of water and then in SIDH 
most of the causes of leukemic hyponatremia most commonly being SIDH there is an increased urine osmolarity why because there is more of water reabsorption causing increased urine osmolarity so uh, continuing when uh, continuing another category of uvolemic hyponatremia we have SIDH um, so what are the what are the conditions which uh, stimulate ADH secretion normally in a normal patient you have hypovolemia and hyperosmolality in any normal patient uh, this would this should this, these are the triggers for secretion of ADH but here in SIDH what happens is that uh, there is an abnormal secretion of uh, ADH that is there is an excess secretion of ADH it's normally regulated by central nervous system through neural inputs and also chest via baroreceptors so uh, there's a reason why a uh, lot of conditions contributing to SIDH are due to uh, neurological conditions it could be infections CNS infections like meningitis brain tumors hemorrhage intracranial hemorrhage all of them can uh, lead to SIDH and coming to pulmonary conditions um, anything pneumonia lung cancer all of these conditions can also cause SIDH and then other other category you cannot forget is drugs which either increase ADH secretion or uh, potentiate its action so just remember it blindly SIDH three big categories something wrong with the brain or lungs or drugs so that covers most of the causes of SIDH there there you go there's a lot of repetition I'm sorry but uh, here is a greater detail about the kind of conditions that you see CNS disorders you have stroke trauma infection pulmonary disorders pneumonia TB and drugs anti-epileptics SSRIs that is uh, antidepressants serotonin uh, antagonists all these all these drugs can cause SIDH and I just mentioned that post-operative pain nausea all these things can uh, all these conditions can uh, also cause SIDH and then you got this idiopathic and how to diagnose patients are uvolemic they're not fluid overloaded they're not hypovolemic uh, their volume status is normal um, they're uh, um, of course they have their hypotonic it comes under hypotonic uvolemic hyponatremia urine osmolality is high it's, it's not low it's high urine sodium is not low um, BUN that is a blood urea nitrogen uric acid are, uh, are, are, are low most of the times and please exclude thyroid and thyroid the hypothyroidism and under insufficiency so what are the clinical features of hyponatremia well this depends on severity both the severity and acuity what do you mean by acuity I mean if 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 it is an acute hyponatremia suppose the sodium level drops within hours to days then the patient becomes symptomatic very fast on the other hand if the sodium drops slowly or over a period of weeks or months and the brain has this uh, mechanism of adaptation so the symptoms are kind of uh, not seen until the sodium goes down very very low so um, the symptoms depend on how how fast the sodium level um, falls initially I mean 130 to 135 you don't have any symptoms and then mild symptoms initially anorexia nausea malaise and then they progress to headache confusion lethargy and also very serious side effects may result if uh, proper action is not taken on time it can lead to seizures coma brainstem herniation and even death so how do you evaluate a patient with uh, hyponatremia take a very good history of medications please because uh, uh, in my experience uh, uh, medications are either solely responsible or are, are contributory in many of the patients that we see on day to day basis they might be on hydrochlorothiazide they may be on antidepressants anti-epileptics uh, diuretics so please make a list of the home medications then um, see whether there is any change in the fluid intake is the patient drinking too much of water is the patient uh, not taking any fluids uh, and, um, and also the fluid output is the patient having any diarrhea is the patient having um, polyuria or, or putting out large volumes of uh, urine so all these things are important and physical examination is very important um, to cat categorize volume status um, to look at the patient's uh, skin turgor look at the patient's blood pressure look for how orthostatic hypotension uh, all this gives you a clue regarding uh, the volume status um, in hypervolemia of course we look for uh, basal lung rolls or crackles basal lung crackles JVP elevation congestive hepatomegaly, pedal edema, pitting pedal edema so uh, 
A good physical exam helps us to identify under which, these, which of these three categories the patients uh, fall. So then you are going to check serum electrolytes, creatinine, osmolality. You are going to check urine osmolality as well in addition to serum, in addition to serum and also check urine sodium, spot sodium. So management depends on the rate of development of hyponatremia and also severity. So the, if the hyponatremia develops quickly over hours to days, if it's uncorrected, then it can cause cerebral edema. So that's the reason why you correct it rapidly. So a lot of times if the patient has any neurological symptoms, then we use 3% saline. Um, don't, don't, don't use 3% saline uh, in, uh, in, in asymptomatic patients. Um, but you should use it if it is uh, acute hyponatremia and the patient has some neurological symptoms. There is a formula for uh, how much 3% saline to use and I will be covering it in one of my subsequent lectures. Um, what are the principles of treatment? Correct the underlying cause because basically the cost, the treatment depends on the cause, right? Um, so if hypovolemic hyponatremia, the treatment is completely different when you compare it to uvolemic or hypervolemic. So look for presenting symptoms, find out whether it's acute or chronic, look for state of hydration and correct the, both sodium and water at the same rate, I mean treat it as at the same rate as they were lost. In acute hyponatremia treat it uh, rapidly whereas in chronic hyponatremia which has developed over weeks to months please be very slow while, while correcting hyponatremia. So, as I, as, I, as I just said, rapid correction is very dangerous in a patient with, with a chronic hyponatremia because then you have this uh, complication, neurological complication called central pontine myelolysis or uh, more recently it is called cerebral osmol osmotic demyelination which is a preventable complication in, in, in most of the conditions if you are careful and, uh, and uh, monitor the patient closely. So um, we'll come to we'll, we'll come to the details of this condition in a little while. So three percent saline should not exceed 0.5 ml per kg body weight per hour, um, not exceeding 30 to 35 ml per hour, and uh, serum sodium should not go up more than eight to ten milliequivalents in the first 24 hours. Um, actually, the latest guidelines say that in patient with chronic hypotrenatremia, the 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 goal should be only six to eight in in in, in 24 hours. Um, so we have to monitor sodium frequently uh, several times a day and uh, make sure it's not going up too too fast. So um, these both remain both both mean the same central pontine central pontine myelolysis that is CPM. This was described initially uh, way back in 1959 and um, what do you see? You have spastic quadriplegia, pseudobulbar palsy, and encephalop encephalopathy. With demyelination seen in pons, and uh, this this condition is irreversible and catastrophic. So, um, so prevention is uh, is better. Um, so take care while uh, while correcting sodium. So I was just telling you that the treatment depends on the cause. So on the left side you have hypovolemic hyponatremia, where you treat with isotonic saline, and then you got water excess. Uh, relative water excess in uvolemia, in uvolemic hyponatremia that is in SIDH where you have to restrict fluids okay and then you got hypervolemic hyponatremia where, which you see in CHF and uh, advanced chronic kidney disease where also you restrict sodium and water and these people may need uh, diuretics in fact and sometimes rarely even dialysis if, if they don't respond to diuretics. So again, um, re repeating what I just said, hypervolemic hyponatremia, give IV normal saline, don't give hypotonic fluids, please don't give D5 water or 5% uh, dextrose. In dilutional hyponatremia, which is uh, seen in SIDH, you will restrict the fluids to 1 liter and if, uh, and if, in, if that's not enough, you will restrict it further. And, pre and please stop the offending drug, whether it is anti-epileptic or antidepressant or, th or thiazide diuretic, whatever. And if they don't respond to this, you can give demeclocycline, which inhibits the action of ADH. Um, and the vasopressin antagonists have come up in the last few years. And you can use this uh, vasopressin is antagonist is, that is uh, nothing but ADH antagonist, uh, which uh, neutralize or uh, counteract the effects of ADH hormone. 
You can use this in euvolemic or hypervolemic hyponatremia. And 12 aptan is an oral preparation available. You can start at 15 milligrams once daily. You can increase it to 30 mg or even 60 milligrams um, depending on the response. And please monitor the patient on the hospital in the initial phase. Conivaptan is uh, given intravenous, intravenously as an IV infusion. Uh, please, please, please don't give vasopressin antagonists in hypovolemic hyponatremia. So if the patient is having acute gastroenteritis with hypovolemia, don't give this. So this is this you should be giving only in euvolemic, that is SIDH, or hypervolemic, like for example, CHF or, uh, or, 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 or CKD. And then you've got hypervolemic hyponatremia where the patients are fluid overloaded and they need diuretics or dialysis or both. And you can also use um, vasopressin antagonists like uh, tolvapan. So coming back to our three cases which uh, we started our uh, presentation with. So remember the first case, the patient had uh, what looks like an acute gastroenteritis and he also is, appears dry, right? Volume depleted, blood pressure is a little low. So yes, so the treatment would be normal saline. I'm sure you guys guessed it right, all the, all the, three, all the three cases by now. So what test would you would you order? I mean, it's pretty obvious. You don't need any tests, but if you want to order some tests, you probably order uh, serum osmolality and urine sodium, right? Urine sodium will be low in a patient with uh, hypovolemic hyponatremia due to extrarenal cause, that is uh, gastrointestinal loss. Okay. This is the second case uh, which uh, which um, I initially mentioned in the beginning. So this patient uh, has a lung malignancy, small cell lung cancer, which is a special category where there is a autonomous production of ADH. Large amounts of, uh, I mean, um, uh, large amounts of ADH hormone is secreted autonomously uh, because it's a paraneoplastic syndrome, small cell lung cancer, and um, uh, that causes euvolemic hyponatremia. Why do you want to give 3% saline? Because patient is symptomatic, he's neurologically, he's somnolent. So initially, you would give three percent saline. Make sure you don't you don't make sure you don't uh, give it uh, too fast because it appears like uh, uh, subacute or chronic presentation. Um, so um, so uh, so so you would want to um, increase the sodium level slowly. You would fluid restrict the patient as well because it is IDH, and also you can use tolvaptan. Last case, this is a patient with uh, what looks like a ischemic cardiomyopathy, congestive heart patient with congestive heart failure with significant past cardiac history. Uh, this patient appears fluid overloaded and uh, the treatment would be, of course you don't want to give saline, it's already fluid overloaded. You don't want to give 3% saline because it's very dangerous in patients with hypervolemic hyponatremia. So please, please, please don't give 3% saline ever in patients with hypervolemia okay so you have to fluid restrict the patients you can give diuretics lasix and also um, low sodium diet um, and also vasopressin antagonists like tolvaptan um, if they don't respond then a few patients may even uh, need dialysis but uh, um, so here the treatment is fluid restriction diuretics so what is the take home message the take home message um, is that that the volume status should be determined for the patient, uh, serum osmolality should be checked and uh, please remember that hyponatremia means water excess relative to sodium and doesn't mean that the total sodium is low okay and uh, treatment depends on the cause as we just discussed and uh, um, in chronic hyponatremia please correct the sodium level slowly to prevent neurological complications. Thank you for patient listening. Um, you can send your feedback to this email conceptsmedicine at gmail.com and do visit uh, my Facebook page for where I discuss some interesting clinical cases and some videos as well. Thank you very much.